it's an off day for the Cleveland Guardians. But hey, they still went up a spot in the standings. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'm going to discuss my current MLB draft big board uh, in preparations for my dual mock with Lindsay of Lockdown Prospects next week. Get to find out who I think is number one. Who, where do I agree and disagree with the rest of the crowd on today's episode of Locked On Guardians? You are Locked On Guardians, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Ellis. I'm the host of Locked on Guardians. Before this, I was a lead draft and prospect analyst at Scout and 24-7, hence one of the reasons I love the draft. Then again, I'm just a Cleveland sports fan. Being a 40-year-old Cleveland sports fan, drafts are practically in my lifeblood. Uh, as I already talked about where I wrote, I want to thank you for making Locked on Guardians your first listen today and every day, wherever it is that you get podcasts. Uh, as you can see by this tale up here, my co-host Nacho is hanging out, ready to contribute as well to the show today. Uh, so without, well, I guess with our little bit of ado, Guardians didn't play. We already did the preview for the uh, the series against the Baltimore Orioles tomorrow. But that, uh, <laughs> excuse me, but that doesn't mean that everything has been uh, stagnant. Oh, no, not at all. The Blue Jays are currently leading the White Sox 8-3 to in the top of the ninth. Uh, as long as the Blue Jays hold on to this one, the Guardians are going to move into second in the division. Uh, the White Sox will fall to third. The Twins lost f- another game to the Tigers. They're really struggling, uh, not playing quite as well as they were in the early season. Uh, it is an interesting time to be a Guardians fan. Uh, the All of a sudden, it's like, oh, hey, they're uh, four and a half back and in second place. It's going to be something interesting to follow. Now let's get into the draft. I get a lot of draft questions, and I would think, hopefully rightfully so, due to my time as a national writer on the draft. That's the one time I actually had a national gig as I wrote on the Major League Draft for Scout in 24-7. And now I do this podcast, I don't have as much time to write. So more of my scouting is done for fun, which one can argue. This has always been, you know, the secondary gig. So where, what does my board look like? How do I agree or disagree with the crowd? Uh, Let's just get into it. I will say I value safety in the draft because the draft is such a crapshoot, and I have a massive aversion to prep arms just because the flame-out rate is incredibly high. Uh, you see too many and or most ending up needing r- arm surgery after being drafted, and that just kind of affects my view. I, I lean into safety. You know, like it, not like it. That is kind of my overall view, but I also uh, put a high value on positional value. And then the one thing that... If I had more inside baseball knowledge that would have a massive effect on these ranks is if I could sit here and line up money. You know, a year ago, I made Henry Davis the top player in the draft. Now, did I think he was the top player on talent? No, I thought he was close, though. I thought he was a very, very talented catcher. But I also knew he'd be significantly cheaper. He was like $3 million cheaper in Jack Leiter. Would I rather have Henry Davis, Lonnie White, and... Uh, was it- no, I want to say Bubba Starling, but that was the outfielder from Nebraska who went to Bubba Chandler. Bubba Starling was the one that the uh, Royals took instead of Fran- Frankie Lindor. But uh, Bubba Chandler, or would you rather have Jack Leiter, who, by the way, is moving down in prospect rankings right now, pitcher I was not all that high on over the course of last year. Uh, I mean, I was still relatively high. I just didn't think he was the top player in the class like a lot of people were talking about. So, like, if I could sit here and be like, okay, this player... And there's some degree of this baked in, just on what you hear. It's like, okay, I'm moving these guys around because of perceived value. That is something else that I take into account. So that's just putting it out there. I made this list, honestly, a few weeks ago. Now it's just kind of a an outline. So like, if you're looking here at this screen, you're like, oh, I see your entire list. I wrote this out a while ago. This just gives me kind of a baseline of the guys that I was really thinking about at the time. I can already tell you what is on here is not staying. This is, again, from a few weeks ago. This is just more so I can look at the list of names and be like, oh, yeah, these are the guys that I was kind of thinking at this point in time. I made a top 36, uh, and there's just a lot of players who are going to move around. Like, I, I can look at it and know players that I am going to be higher on slash lower on than others uh, overall. 
And then some players that I just need to get in here that were not previously mentioned that I hadn't gotten to from the prep group. Uh, Robbie Snelling is, I don't know if I want to call him a pop-up, but he's definitely one of those guys who's charging, who when I wrote this list, I hadn't watched him yet. So things change. That's just the way of this game. What has not changed is the top player in this draft. That is Drew Jones, son of Andrew Jones. There's a lot of his dad. You know, he was maybe more back of the top 10 in the fall, but he's just continued to look good. He's continued to move up boards. The tools were always there, and even in the fall, he was slowly inching up boards. And the defensive profile, up the middle athlete, just the talent profile, he has everything one could want and or need in a center fielder. The potential of a five-tool talent is there. Go over and pull up. I always like to pull up the perfect game uh, data that they have. Why? Because they give you such great percentile data, and it's really good to look at like changes and everything else. And I have to look at that. His arm strength, his fastball, 99th percentile. Uh, his 60-yard splint split. Nope, that's not even a split. It's a 60-yard 99. His 10-yard split, 93rd. Uh, outfield arm, 96. Infield arm, 95. The 30, 90th percentile. Now, his reaction, not, that's a, kind of a new one, 53.08. His shuttle, 93.94. Exit velocity, 96. And then I don't always know about the new K-Motion stuff they have on here. I need to learn. I need to find out more with that but it, all in all everything comes together to look like an elite special hitter and that's why he's the top of the class right now for me coming at number two is brooks lee that is against the field uh, he's just a very safe prospect he's probably not going to stick it short i think most people think the arm will move him to third he's not a plus athlete but he was a borderline first round talent for me at a high school he's gone to college and played well at cal poly playing for his dad he is the safest. He is the player you would predict is going to be the first to the majors from this class. And yeah, he's yeah, the power is the one thing that's not if if he if he could either A stick it short or B have, you know, sixty grade power plus power, he might be the top player in this class. It would be at least up for debate who you wanted to put first. Um right now it's not. You know, the power is probably closer to average. Uh, the athleticism is closer to average, but he hits, and he's got a brilliant way that the zone works, and honestly, if the Guardians were picking number one, he might be the guy they took uh, just because he hits fits their profile, but he's the safe player in this class for me, uh, so I have him as the number two player. Again, that is against conventional wisdom. Let's get through the top four before we hit our break, and number three, I have Kevin Prada, catcher from... Georgia Tech, the next great Georgia Tech catcher. Again, this is a little higher than most. You know, Here's a guy who's still just 20 years of age. He won't turn 21 until August. Uh, hit for big power this year. Did everything well. I mean, he had some first-round talk as a bat-first catcher coming out of high school. Uh, he's you know been around, and he's been extremely productive. And, yeah, he's, of the, the three potential first-round catchers, he's got the worst defense of the group. But man, he can just, he can mash, he can handle the position. It's not like he has to move off of it. I think he can handle catcher. He's never going to be great, but he can be around average. But yeah, the, the plus power at a position that is so hard to find, and that's really what elevated him over the rest of this list. One, I think of, to me, there's a, a clear top six. There's a top six in this year's class. And I think he probably will have the lowest bonus of that top six. That elevated him to positional value. We've talked about how many times now catching is so hard to find. There is just not enough of it for every team to have even an average catcher, as we have seen with the Guardians this year. So I, I'm looking at the positional value. I'm looking at what I perceive to likely be the lowest bonus of kind of this top six elite tier. And that's what kind of elevates him over the next group of players. And then to our number four player, this is where it kind of gets a little hinky. I'm going to go with Jackson Holiday. Uh, originally a Tamar Johnson here when I did this earlier in May, but the reason for Holiday is, again, we're going positional value. Tamar Johnson, I think, is the better hitter. He might be the best hitter in this class. He might end up having a, you know, better than Brooks Lee. That's It's not a hot take to even say that, but just looking at the list here, it just comes down to uh, or Termar Johnson is likely second baseman, left fielder, DH, first base. Jackson Holiday, most people think, is going to stick at shortstop. So it's positional value. Uh, he does you know is there a weakness to his game not really he's another one 
there's some thought that he might go um, first overall, which I still can get behind because I think he will be cheaper than Drew Jones uh, in terms of perceived signing bonus. Maybe I'm wrong there. but And he's a true shortstop. He's going to be able to play that position and play it well. And you look at a team like Baltimore, talked about this on the show the other day, uh, they have like no shortstop prospects. So that's that's the other thing. I mean, again, it's positional value matters. I put a high value on where players I perceive can end up. And that is what puts him a little bit higher is I think he's a shortstop. Same reason Parada was higher because I think he is a catcher. That gives them some additional elevation in terms of, yeah, offensively, Tamar Johnson has a higher ceiling than either of these last two players. But it's not all about offense. And that's how we get to this top four. Let's take a quick commercial break, come back, and keep going. And our first fantastic sponsor is with Spring in the Air. It's time of renewal and growth, personally and professionally. As small businesses grow, LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. Care, uh, create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Then add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word you're hiring so your network can help you find the right people to hire. Simple tools like screening questions make it Easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. That's why small businesses rated LinkedIn Jobs number one in develop, delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to find, you want to talk to faster. Did you know every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MLB. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MLB to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So I mentioned there's a top six. We've talked about four of the top six. Who are these last two? Next for me is Tamar Johnson, the maybe the best hitter in this class, uh, maybe the highest offensive ceiling in this class. You go and if, if I were to pull up his perfect game data, which I'll do right now, uh, it is going to be sick. You know, we went through and discussed the percentiles for um, for Andrew Jones, but Tamar Johnson is right there in terms of percentiles. And by the way, he's still just 17. He is also young for his class, fits those models well. Exit velocity, 98th percentile. Uh, you know, 60 yard, 93, 86 for 10 yard split. Kind of miss when they had like the moment of impact, the bat speed ones. They don't have those anymore. They've got this new set of data that I'm just not as familiar with. So I don't know like peak speeds. Like, I don't know what's a good speed gain and i, I gotta kind of sit down i gotta talk to someone uh who knows this a little bit better because i don't necessarily know their new bits of data that they do with k motion uh, but there is a pg tech faq i have to look into but johnson just has physical traits that give him a chance to be an elite hitter he uses all the fields uh, he's going to get a chance to showcase in a summer league before the draft he didn't face the best competition. Well, he's at Maze. Maze is good. What was the knock? I feel like there was a knock on him about competition or something along that. I can't remember now. I mean, there is the positional knock about where he's going to play. I don't think he is. Oh, no, he did commit. He finally committed to Arizona State. He was uncommitted for the longest time. Um, yeah, so, like, you go to MLB.com and decide to pull up their list to look at if he was committed. And, you know, that some evaluators give his bat the top of the scale 80 grades. One scout gave him a double Hall of Famer comp by comparing him to a combination of Wade Boggs' plate discipline and Vladdy Guerrero Sr.'s bat-to-ball skills. That is something special. Uh, you know, he is going to... He's going to hit. I have full faith in that. He is not the biggest guy. Size is an issue. Position is an issue. But the offensive profile is what's getting him here. You'll figure out a way to play him. You'll figure out where to play him. Uh the reason he's a little bit lower is just positional value. That, that's what it comes down to for me. Uh, because if everyone hits their peak, Johnson might be more valuable. But at the same time, you know, can you trade a middle of the lineup catcher for just about anything? Because they're so hard to find. So that leaves the last of the group and the player that, you know, some people viewed as a generational talent this time a year ago, and that's Elijah Green, son of former uh, Pittsburgh Steelers tight end Eric Green. I think he's just got a little more risk than everyone else in this group. Uh, if you told me he ended up being the top player in this draft, I would not be surprised. If you told me he turned into a quad A type, I would not be surprised. Uh, elite physical tools. I know I keep saying that, but when you're talking about Jones, Johnson, and Green, I mean, we really, even going back to some guys like uh, Benny Thompson a year ago or two years ago, 
when we're looking at like Robert Hassel and those guys, they don't compare. These three guys just have better physical tools than those players. So when we're looking at those type of talent, that's why it's like a clear top six to me. You have the two high-end performing college players, one of who plays one of the hardest positions to fill. You've got the four elite um, prep talents, three of them with athletic bloodlines, two of them being uh, fathers who were exceptional players of baseball. And then we kind of hit the next tier for me. And I lead this off with Jace Jung from Texas Tech. Uh, there are some people who do not love the swing. There are some people who, you know, being maybe a, a second base only type, that the positional value is a little bit lower. I, he hits. He hits for power. He's got a chance for plus hit, plus power. I I would rather get a second baseman. And I know a lot of people love uh, Jacob Berry. Why do I have Jace Jung higher? I still think second base is more valuable than DH. Uh, yes, Barry probably has a better overall bat, but I think Jung can handle second base. Uh, it's going to take a team that's uh, willing to gamble because it is a, you know, just go watch him. You're going to see it's he doesn't look normal when he's up there batting. It's not the typical approach, and it's one of those things that there are people who just ding him down because they think that it's not going to work, that his whole setup is is just a disaster waiting to happen. I, I've never been that person who's willing to be like, there's only like three ways to hit. I just, I don't believe in that at all. So I think I have Jace Jung here. Um, after him, I put Cam Collier again. Like he is the reclassified son of Lou Collier. And I'm going to not as quite of elite physical tools. Like I don't know if he's going to hit for power, He's not the best athlete, but I think he's got a really strong hit tool. Still just 17 years of age because he was supposed to be in next year's draft class. Uh, one of those kind of advanced players who's the son of a big league player. I, I think it is, you know, it's a, it, I'm just kind of, like, is it too much to say it's a little bit of a Cabron Hayes starter kit? I, that's what I keep coming back to with him. Like, I feel like there's some similarities between those two players. Um, Maybe that's not enough ceiling for you, but that's that's kind of what I feel like I see. And for me, that's plenty ceiling. That's a it's a plus defender at third base with a plus hit and then average everything else across the board. So that's why I have him a little bit higher than some and I'm sure lower in others. And again, the age is a thing that is beneficial too. And I feel like this is where I'm probably going to go way off board here. This is maybe something that will surprise some people. We've got the top eight. Consensus at this point is typically Gavin Cross. I don't know why I'm not as high on Gavin Cross. Uh, you know, it's not like he is a ton lower. Don't get me wrong here. But what's going to throw a wrench in things is my ninth rated player is Jet Williams. The uh, shortstop who is committed to Mississippi State, Texas kid. He is, you know, he is just a tick below that elite group of, of green Jones and Johnson for athleticism. Like I put him solidly in the same level as like Jackson Holiday and ahead of Cam Collier. Uh, he would have been draftable as a pitcher or as a shortstop. He is a shortstop. He you go again, pull a perfect game. His uh, you know ninety seven percentile in the sixty yard split or in the sixty yard ninety uh, first percentile ten yard split infield arm ninety seven percentile exit velocity ninety fourth percentile. Why is Jet Williams as a shortstop? I've talked about many times on this show. Shortstop are the quarterback of the uh, the MLB draft. They always have tons of value because every team wants them, and they have just more value in trades in general because he's five foot eight. Let's just be honest about that. He is five foot eight. He is not just undersized; he is small. But I think you look at what he does. This is just to me a classic example of if Jet Williams was six feet tall, I think he'd be in discussion to be the top pick in this draft. There are people who think he's got, you know, plus hit tool. And, I, you know, it, and here's my other issue. Like we talked about his exit velocity already discussed is 94th percentile in this class. But people will say he's got below average power just because he's five foot eight. Not necessarily because of uh, you know, swing or approach or anything like that. He, you know, I, I think there's more there. And I think he's being underestimated because of size. And I just think that it still happens. You know, we see more acceptance when it's like, okay, 
for pitchers who are getting a little smaller. But a 5'8 guy is still a 5'8 guy to the rest of this league. I think he's a shortstop all the way. You know, he's he. You know, there's also the, the health concerns, which then people freak out because he's five foot eight. It's like, oh, he's going to wear down. He's just hit at every level. He's always looked good. He's faced top competition. I think he's a shortstop. He has the athleticism to play anywhere on the diamond. Shortstops rise in value. He is in that second tier of second tier of elite athletes. There isn't any issue here outside of potentially health because you know it's like there's a shoulder issue. There's another issue in size. That's it. So I'm going way off the board here. I think he's in the 20s or 30s most places, and I'm putting him 9 because I think he's a shortstop, and shortstops are incredibly valuable. I talked about I put position positional value as one of those things high on my list. And, you know, nowadays the discussion on hit tools is so much better than it used to be. When everyone talks about him as one of the best hitters in this class, it means, oh, because he can work counts. He's able to identify what pitches are, and he's not just immediately getting eaten up by off-speed stuff like a lot of high school kids. So, Jet Williams, surprise in the top 10 for me. I know that is not most people. This is where I'm going to be massively different than most rankings. We'll take a quick break here, come back, and keep going. We'll see how far we can get on today's episode of Locked On Guardians. And it's my favorite sponsor. It's BuiltBar.com. Let's go to Built Bar and see what the current deal is because there's always a deal. There's always someone returning, something returning. There's always something happening at BuiltBar.com. Can't rest on your laurels. Orange is back. I do love their orange. Right now, orange is back. I talked about my favorite bar ever is the granola. You can get a granola mix box right now. You can get coconut chocolate, chocolate peanut butter, white chocolate berry. All of those are there. Birthday cake is currently on sale. They have a summer bundle right now over at BuiltBar.com. What do you get in a summer bundle? You get a water bottle. You get a uh, a little cooler. I have my own mini cooler. And you get a box of the, let's see, you get a Black Cherry Built Boost, which is what you put in your drinks, uh, a travel cooler, and a one of a box of bars. Get a mixed box of bars. So, and that's right now for 35 bucks. You get a water bottle, a travel cooler, a whole container of Built Boost, and a box of bars. So like the bars themselves would normally be somewhere in the 20s. So you're getting a lot of fantastic deal over at BuiltBar.com today. And remember when you go to BuiltBar.com today, always try to use the promo code LOCKEDON1. It helps us look good over here at LOCKEDON. But sometimes they allow you to use that promo code with sales and sometimes they don't. There's always something happening. Right now there is a lot happening between the summer bundle, the birth cake, the birthday cake, granola, and the return of orange. Now has been never been a better time to go get the best tasting protein bars on the market with BuiltBar.com. Okay, so here we go at 10. I have Gavin Cross. He, you know, he's done everything. I, again, it, there's this, I think it's just kind of my Virginia Tech, like, uh, issue more than anything else. It's one of those things where I'm like, I haven't spent a lot of time on players from this program. I wasn't as big into, uh, Gavin Cross is about my fourth outfielder from the college group in the offseason. That's more on me than on him. Uh, I should like him more. 14 home runs. He has walked over 10% of the time. Strikeout percentage is around 14. That's low. His bat pip is solid, but not spectacular. Uh, he's a good player. He excelled for Team USA. The cape was a very limited sample size, and it didn't go great. And I think maybe that is what it is. I, I see that data, and I'm always like, eh. But the Team USA stuff is what really caused him to pop. And it's been good, but not great numbers. I can't help but feel that, like, in another draft class, he might be more in the teens. But I'm he's safe. He is a very safe outfielder. I don't think he's going to be a star, but I think he's a very high chance of being a solid, you know, 55-grade player. And I know I'm the king of safety with these things, but, you know, I still have him just kind of there because I don't... There isn't an outcome where I see him becoming a star. Maybe that's on me, and maybe I'm going to end up very wrong but I don't see a path to get him there. Uh, 11, Jacob Berry. I know, super low compared to most, but I just, he doesn't have position. And like first base only prospects, when you go through in recent years, it's like, well, Spencer Torkelson, there was debate if he could play third or in left. Uh, Pavin Smith has spent a lot of time in left. I don't think Jackson Berry can play left field. I think he's a first base, a DH, and it's always harder on those guys in general because you have to be highly productive, and he, he should be. He's been highly productive in college. I think he'll be a good hitter, but I think there's more risk with a first base only type than we often give credit because they have to work out perfectly. Uh, if there's something less than, 
it's often harder to break through. So it just that's kind of my own personal issue. 12 is Cole Young, the shortstop from Pittsburgh, who has some top 10 talk. Uh, he is... So why Williams over Young when most places have Cole Young over Williams? I think Williams is a little bit of a better athlete. <laughs> so I was wanting to pull up his perfect game stuff, and I learned that apparently that's a Mortal Kombat character if you don't put perfect game in front of it. Um, or behind it, I should say. Uh, you know, Young is bigger. I think the consensus is that he's going to have power. I think he's just... He's a good athlete in his own right. He's got like very similar exit velocities and percentiles. I think Williams is just a little bit of a better hitter and is a little bit of a better athlete. Uh, I think he is a likely shortstop though as well. And putting him at twelve is, I think, should be a sign that I still really like him. It's it's three spots lower. Uh, it's no big knock on him compared to the field. I, yes, we are twelve deep without the mention of a pitcher. But again, I am lower on prep arms, and the college group is poison uh, this year. If they are not hurt, they are ineffective, or they are more of a back-end type. And this is really kind of where I get a bit of a, a break in my rankings. Like, next grouping, it starts to get a little bit more risk. This is essentially where we enter a third tier. And again, I'm going to go against type, because most people put Jordan Beck as the first rounder from Tennessee. I like Drew Gilbert better. Now, Beck has the upside, and what's the popular comp is Hunter Renfro, and I'm like, how many teams have traded Hunter Renfro? Like, he's effective, but he's not someone the team seem to want to build around because it's kind of an infuriating profile. Drew Gilbert, go and look at it. I and mean, He's got a near, he has a one-to-one walk-to-strikeout ratio, both at 14%. Bat pip is spectacular. He's a center fielder. Yeah, the only nine home runs. Maybe he doesn't have the ceiling of Beck, but I think he's going to be really a safe center fielder. I think he's got, you know, elite tools. He can play in center field. Uh, again, let me go pull up his exact height numbers. I think what we're seeing with him and maybe why I am the high man again is he's 5'9". Uh, you know, people are going to just sit back and think that he can't, you know, he's going to be below average power, this or that. Uh, he's been a very good player for them. He's, you know, he runs well. He's hit well. He's done everything well. I was a pretty good pitcher back in the day. I think people are kind of sleeping on him, so I'm I'm putting him at 13, kind of at the next of tiers. Again, I know, unusual, not consensus, but that's where I am. 14, Dylan Lesko. Dylan Lesko is probably the best pitching prospect I scouted the last three years, but he has Tommy John surgery. Best high school pitching prospect. Let me clarify. Uh, highest ceiling. I like him more than anyone I saw. <laughs> Pardon me. I need, like, a cough thing or... <clears throat> to reach up and hit mute in time. Uh, but he's hurt. You know, he's not the traditional build. He's uh, like 6'2", righty, I want to say. Not the biggest kid. The injury is a concern because, again, it is not 100% one-to-one. Everyone always comes back the same. But I have him kind of here. Just I mean, the ceiling is great. The pitch mix, what he showed was spectacular for a high school arm. Like I said, he's probably the best prep grade I've given in the last three years. That being said, I'm just lower on prep players, and he's hurt. Uh, 14, I have Daniel Susak from Arizona, dropping him a bit compared to most. Uh, I always get, <laughs> this is really judgy, but draft eligible sophomores, I just, this is, comp- I need to sit down and actually do the data. But in my, what I've gone through the years of like putting guys in these camps and talking about draft eligible sophomores, those guys don't tend to end up performing as well. I don't know what it is about that, uh, if it's the lack of data we have with those players or what, but when I see a draft-eligible sophomore, it just kind of dings him. He's played great in Arizona, where a lot of guys play great, where you know Kevin Newman and Scott Kingery played their way into high first-round picks with performances and have both been below-average bats in, in a weak conference. So yes, he has played well. He handles the staff well. He is the mid-tier defender of that first-round group. He is the mid-tier bat. He is the older player. Uh, I am just a little bit lower because I don't quite see... I think he's closer to average across the board. So again, I know that goes seriously against type overall in the way these are perceived because he's top 10, I think, everywhere on every board. So yeah, I'm I'm, I'm going against type. Uh, next for me is Connor Prelip, the Alabama lefty. 
we've got what, like 20 innings, but they were spectacular. Two plus pitches. If he had been healthy, and we talked about Jet Williams at three more inches, four more inches, he would be in discussion for the top pick in this draft class. If Connor Prelip had been healthy, he would be in discussion for the top pick in this class, is my general view. Now, that's also assuming that he had been healthy and performed well. So we're putting a lot of this, you know, okay, so if A plus B equals C, when we don't have A or B. But what we've seen, what is there in this class, the ceiling is enough that, like I said, I think he could be an ace. I legitimately think he could be an ace. But, you know, it was it hockey prospects they don't exist anymore it's a website but when they existed they did this great thing that was like they gave someone like an a4 or something like that or a 5c like what is the i think the letter was the volatility so he would be a player that if i go back it's like he would be a, a four or a five I, you know i'd have to look at their system i don't want to oversell it and say hall of famer no i just want to say he's a potential ace all-star type but the volatility is as high as anyone because we just haven't seen him play so i have some big risk concerns with him but I, I just can't look past the ceiling. I can't look past the pat fact that, like, there is... I'm not the only person saying that if he had been healthy all year, if he hadn't gotten hurt last year and been able to show what he could do, that he would be in the top pick discussion. And when we're talking about... Let's see. So this is a problem with me kind of adjusting a bit as I go. But we're talking about him at, what, 14th on my board? 15th on my... Let me pause so I can get this exactly right. Let me update things. 16. He is 16 on my board. And again, just because of that overall ceiling, I see with him as a player uh, that makes me consider him at this point in time, uh, the player that I would draft. Again, the thing I don't know is health. And with all these players, I don't know what the bonus demand is. That would have an effect on my rankings if I knew all of those. Uh, 17, I'm going with Justin Crawford, another famous son of a former major leaguer, extremely athletic. It's a starter kit it's a tools kit to be again he is in that tier of jet williams with me maybe even that top tier of athletic uh players comes from a, one of the more storied high school programs in the country has been productive uh, at this point in time when there is so much risk in this draft i'd rather bet on ceiling he fits for ceiling speaking of ceiling i have brock porter at 18 the michigan kid uh prep arm number two prep arm for me still is brock porter He's kind of just your traditional right-handed prep arm. You know, like, big kid, throws hard. Uh, front of the rotation potential, probably more two than a one. But has the build, has the stuff, just that kind of right-handed pitcher that you see middle of the first round every year. The the Micabell, uh type from two years ago. It just, it's not a knock on him. He's a, he's a very good prospect. Again, I'm just not as high on prep arm, so that's going to cause him to get dinged. Let's try to get the 21 uh, total on mine, just so I can have a nice, weird, uneven number. <sighs> because I don't, you know, nothing can, can be nice and straightforward and simple when it comes to me. And then next up, and I, I really debated. It's like these two players could be like 18 and 19 or like flip them around and go the other way. I, I was very... Temp the, okay, so I have more knowledge of Porter. I've seen more of Porter. I feel a little more comfortable in Porter uh, being safer, but Snelling is at 19 for me. Robbie Snelling, who's been kind of rising throughout the course of the year, left-handed pitcher from Nevada, excellent athlete, uh, was going to play um, baseball and football, I believe, like Division One at both. That type of athlete, lefty with good secondary stuff, has <clears throat> excuse me hit the upper 90s. Just seems to be moving up boards all the time to the point where, if you're a betting person. I think he's a good bet to be the top prep arm off the board. Just the way his momentum is going, the way you know he's got the the profile of athleticism and the things that people love, I think he has a chance to be the top lefty off the board. And again, if you wanted to put, if you wanted to flip him in in Lesko because Lesko's hurt, I get it. If you wanted to flip him in Porter because he's a lefty, I get it. But I think this is to me the top three tier. I think for the prep arms after these three guys, there is a drop. But that is why I kind of wanted to get them all back into the top 20, uh, be just because of my natural aversion to prep uh, players. I know, you know Brandon Berea is someone that also gets discussed in this grouping at this level. Jackson Ferris, I think J.R. Ritchie's kind of moving down a bit. 
but th these are the guys, the three names that just as you're going through and looking at pure stuff, were the ones that stood out the most to me. And then for this 20th selection, I'm going to stick with Chase DeLauer. I know there are people who are completely off him. Here's my view. He was awesome on the Cape. He was awesome on the Cape, and that means a lot. Uh, it is more of a concern for me if a guy has a great junior year but can't hit with wood bats. Never thought that would be the case. I used to say that, you know, people overvalued it. It should be a plus but never a negative, and that's when I loved Will Craig. You learn over the years with this that that, that time facing elite talent, you know, don't let Nick Gonzalez be the example, right? Like, Nick Gonzalez fell to the Pirates at 8 when he should have gone higher because he had a bad weekend against Asa Lacey, right? The louder, if you want to knock him because of uh, health and because he got hurt and we didn't get to see him and he was bad against Florida State, he, he was solid overall this year. He faced elite competition in the Cape, and he was good. He was very good. Plus athlete, young for the class. He's going to be 20 on draft day. There are a lot of reasons to still be high on him, and I'm going to buy that what he did on the Cape was closer to what he is than a bad weekend against two of the most advanced uh, left-handed pitchers in the country. That I mean, everyone has a hard time with lefties and you're facing two of the most advanced lefties in the country. That's a hard situation for anyone, let alone a guy who just hasn't had the innings of a lot of players um, when it comes to this draft. So I said we were going to go to 21. Who is that final player? I'm putting Logan Tanner at 21, the catcher from, uh, oh, don't want to get this wrong, from Mississippi State. Why him here? I know some people are not as high on him as I am, I think he's the best defender of this group. He maybe doesn't have the power, hasn't had the big production of the other two catchers. I mean, definitely has not hit like Parada and has not hit how uh, Susak has in terms of average. But he's handled elite pitching. You know he can handle it. Uh, he is a player who has been an excellent defender. You go and you look at his good walk percentage, good strikeout percentage. You know, he's hit enough home runs, maybe not a ton, but I think he'll be, you know, an average. He's, you know, the 812 OPS. The fact it was a worse year this year than last year, I think, scares some people off. I think he's going to be about an average catcher offensively. And again, the premium value on that position when he could be a plus defender, but an average bat, that balances out for me. Now, overall, over the course of this year, I have soured a little bit more on him as the year has gone on. Um, I wanted to see more production. I always do have a bit of a concern when a guy doesn't step up in that final year because you are older, you are bigger, you are the guy who, uh, you know, the fact that the power has really fallen off this year, you expect as a player gets older, especially in college, that they're going to dominate, that they're going to find a new gear because they are just the older player. They've had the experience, they've had the reps, they've had the time to, you know, become a better, uh, not necessarily athlete, but grow into their physique. And he hasn't done that. And that is my one concern. He is 21 right now because I believe he can be league average bat and a plus defender. But he is a player that very much could slide in my listing. So that's my top 21 as it is now. I see scratch outs and changes throughout. Um, I was just kind of, I had the list in front of me. I've done the research. I've watched the video, pull up the stats, things like that. I don't have it all internalized. But, you know, just going through these names of players and, you know, just some of them that I'm, you know, Gabriel Hughes, I'm not quite as high on. Some of the high school, Mickey Romero is a guy who is very much close to making this list. Nick Zito, Justin Camp, Nick Zito, no, Zach Nito, Justin Campbell. These are players that I really like that I didn't get to to quite get into. Uh, uh, Tucker Toman, the prep player, is another guy who's very close. Ju uh, Jude Fabian. I keep wanting to move him higher because I think he has shown stuff this year. Most people don't agree with me because they get focused on the average. But yeah, there's a lot of players. Uh, Sterling Thompson, I originally had in the, I think he's my one player from the front page here who didn't actually make it uh, from the first rankings. But he's, you know, in that group. He's in that next group of players for me, uh, the Florida outfielder. He's he's in there with Romero, Nito. Uh, those three are probably the next three up for Intel and Beavers for me in this group overall. I hope you enjoyed the draft content. We can continue to giving more. And like I said, I will be giving more draft content specifically. Ooh, 40 minutes. Boy, did I go long just to get to 21 names. 40 minutes for 21 names. I've been Jeff Ellis. This has been the Lockdown Guardians podcast. Remember, rate, review, download daily. That really helps. Uh, if you enjoy the draft content, let me know. Comment. Argue with me. That's fine. I have a different approach than most. And I understand that. And there are certain things I look for. 
and statistically certain things I definitely look for, then make it so I might challenge, uh, have a very different approach than others. So I welcome all comments, welcome all debate. Uh, just be kind. That is my one rule. I am always trying to be respectful myself. It's uh, kind of the teacher's motto. I've been Jeff Ellis. This is the Left and Guardians podcast. I already said all that other stuff, so go, go, Guardians, go.